from the Mercy One Studio. Making it personal with Bishop William Johnson on Iowa Catholic Radio and iowacatholicradio.com. Welcome to Making It Personal with Bishop Johnson. I'm Kelly Mesher Collins with the Diocese of Des Moines. On today's show, we're visiting with Bishop James Conley of the Diocese of Lincoln to talk about his upbringing, service, and reflections. But before we get to today's interview, let's find out what's on the bishop's mind. Well, good morning, Kelly. Good morning. And we're still in the Christmas season yes. here as we approach the Feast of the Baptism of the Lord, kind of mm-hmm. wrapping up the mysteries of Christmas in a way. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, the wedding feast of Cana and also the Epiphany, mm-hmm. a great feast that uh, we celebrate too. I hope you had a great Christmas celebration. I know I saw you at some points during all that as you helped yes, me with I some did. of my productions. But uh, <laughs> there's one video I did not appear in that I was really kind of uh, taken aback as I saw your uh, with the Diocesan Pastoral Center had a little fun and uh, put together a little video, John Wynn and his uh, yeah. team. But uh, but your kickboxing, kickboxing prowess was on display there yeah. as well. So, I mean, I already respected you, but now I'd never want to get on your bad side or if I any you know yeah. ever offer a snarky comment or something. I better make sure I have a mouthpiece in here because, you know, too many years of braces with these teeth, I'd like to keep them if possible. So does Jason, your husband, does he? He, he does not uh, kickbox now. I've invited him different times, but. Oh, this sounds like potential domestic <laughs> <laughs> abuse in the brewing. Here. I swear there's none, but okay, it's a no, good release. It's a good release. Yeah, yes. no, it, it is. So, but again, I hope you had beautiful celebrations mm-hmm. and I was able to be not only at the cathedral, but then with the refugee mass mm-hmm. and some of the communities, Father Ambrose Ledoux tells us we have 15,000 uh, Catholics in the diocese, particularly in the Des Moines Metro, from different nationalities who are immigrants oh, and refugees. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I think it kind of raised my consciousness mm-hmm. even more about, mm-hmm. you know, the pastoral desire. To, to serve these people as sure. well, and so to be present to them. Uh, you know, different people have different customs during the Christmas season. For mm-hmm. some people, I know my mom and my brother can't stand It's a Wonderful Light, that uh, my Frank Capra <laughs> movie. But for some of us, that's must-see TV you know, during the season to watch that. Even better than Christmas Story, you know, mm. movies over there. But uh, I was taken by an article by James Matthew Wilson. He was reflecting on on uh, It's a Wonderful Life. And even though the, the name of Jesus hardly, if at all, appears in that, it is something that's you know, kind of infused with the Catholic sensibility, you know, almost a sacramental imagination. And Wilson writes, George's life is wonderful not because he enjoys it. He experiences mostly travails and disappointments. It's wonderful because despite his trials, he comes to see that particular concrete things are good. Coconuts and ice cream, dance and song, the love of a spouse, Zuzu's little flower, and even the crude stuff of bread, salt, and wine that Mary uses to christen the new homes that George's building and loan has helped to finance. This vision of the world is ultimately the real significance of Christmas, to see and stuff, just as Jesus taking on our flesh is at the heart of it, obviously, mm-hmm. the, the great sacramental transformation as well. But how our calendar then, you know, people, you know, the Christmas music disappears on most radio mm-hmm. stations, even the classical stations, the day after Christmas. Mm-hmm. But I think this really absorbing this mystery that the calendar reminds us that it's not just about generating sentiments, but there's something there that we're tethered to a reality that stands outside ourselves. We don't establish the moment of our joy. Joy breaks into our existence, and then we are invited to come and adore and to ponder the mystery, as Mary did in so many ways. Obviously, uh, the you know it can't just all be uh, nice uh, sugar plums and lollipops uh, during that season. The church is marked, obviously, with the Feast of the Holy Innocents a few mm-hmm. days after, and so we're mm-hmm. conscious of all life and things that are there. I was a little bit disturbed uh, as I received an invitation a few weeks back by the Des Moines Faith, Center, Faith Committee for Peace, who wanted to commemorate the Feast of the Holy Innocents by acknowledging all children who are victims of war and violence in, in nations where there's lethal force being used. That's uh, something that we very much wanted to be in solidarity with, weeping for our children and have a prayer service. And so I thought maybe we could transcend some of the traditional cultural divides, you know, left and right and things. So I suggested maybe Iowans for Life could also be a sponsor of that. And so God bless Tom Quiner of Iowans for Life. who reached out to them. And they didn't even want to talk to Tom because even though they're into uh, praying for and advocacy for uh, victims of war, children, they say they're ardently pro-choice. And so the disconnect there, mm-hmm. you know, location, location, location. Mm-hmm. I guess if you're in the womb, you're not not to be defended in that mm-hmm. way in the prayer that there. So obviously the, the cultural tensions that mark Jesus' time are still with us as we want to be advocates of the, the life that is true life who came into the world that darkness cannot overcome. So we have our, our uh, challenges before us in the new year 2021, but with great hope and trust that God's grace and favor are with us. 
All right, we're going to take a quick break and return. We'll welcome Bishop Conley of the Diocese of Lincoln. Thank you, Blessment International, for their support of Iowa Catholic Radio. Everyone lives their life 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. How we use that time directly affects if our life will leave a significant impact or not. Each year, Blessment International leads Central Iowans on a 12-day, all-inclusive experience sharing the heart of Christ with children in South Africa. Teams are forming to do something significant in an African child's life. Learn more at BlessmentInternational.org. That's BlessmentInternational.org. Is it time for a new roof? Then it could be time for you to get to know Bell Construction. Bell Construction is a roofing company entering its 30th year of business. They specialize in residential re-roofs, like commercial jobs, and have the experience to meet all of your roofing needs with personal service. With Bell Construction, the owner will come to your home or place of business in person to inspect and ensure the quality of work that you deserve. They pride themselves in working with you on a personal basis and making sure you are satisfied. Bell Construction, 515-963-4494. Welcome back. I'm Kelly Mesher Collins with the Diocese of Des Moines. You're listening to Making It Personal with Bishop Johnson. On today's show, we're visiting with Bishop James Conley of the Diocese of Lincoln. We're visiting with him about his upbringing, service in the Lincoln Diocese, and much more. Good morning, Bishop Conley. Thanks for making time with us. And this is kind of a poignant time for you personally as you uh, uh, lost your mother, Betty Conley, uh, the week before Christmas. So condolences to you and your sister and all your family as well. So yeah. Uh, Thank you, Bishop. Yeah. You, she she lived a long life, and uh, uh, just from the, uh, the obituary that was shared with all bishops, uh, a very rich life, too. Uh, uh, you know, uh, it seems like she was kind of an extrovert working with the public and things and retail and, and all that, and then uh, socialite and everything else. And uh, she seems like the kind of woman, if I was leading a pilgrimage, I'd want her to be along just to, to lead the social time at the end of the day after we go to churches and museums and then maybe have her be part of the social hour. Could you just comment on that a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. Well, she, yeah, she was, she was very social. She was always the last one to leave a party and she uh, always was, you know, play, signing up for all the activities where she was living, this last place she was living, bingo and bridge and all the activities they have for the residents. And she always cherished her happy hour. <laughs> Every day at 4, 4 p.m., she had uh, two Bud Lights. And I attribute her longevity <laughs> to the two Bud Lights every day at 4. She may not have been raised a Catholic, switched... but that's very Catholic of her. Yes. Right? <laughs> it was. Yeah, it was. Yeah. yeah it, that and, the, bing- right. that she, and uh, the bingo, you know. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah, you know, we switched out uh, to non alcoholic a couple of years ago, and she never knew the difference. Ah, oh, um, okay. But uh, I was talking to our mutual friend, George Weigel. He was sending his condolences, and he was saying that, uh, you know, if your mother had lived to be 93, I would have upgraded her to a craft beer. <laughs> so That sounds like George. <laughs> but, she liked, but she liked the Bud Light. She liked the Bud Light. Yeah, well, that's, that's, it's good to be uh, uh, faithful. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, yeah. you, you are a native of the Midwest, and uh, I think it's safe to say you didn't grow up thinking you'd become a Catholic priest. Could you comment a little bit more just about the, the family narrative that eventually led you to the University of Kansas? Right. I grew up as a Protestant uh, Presbyterian, uh, kind of a uh, in name only. We really didn't uh, go to church you know, on a regular basis, and I didn't really have much religious formation, but when I came to the University of Kansas in the early 70s, there was a, a humanities program that was for freshmen and sophomores, which introduced the students to the great books of Western culture. And this was, a, when I, when I, sometimes when I explain the program, it, it sounds almost like it's, it was a, uh, like an advanced program or some sort of uh, honors program, but it really wasn't. They used to, the professors used to say, this is a remedial program. You guys should have read all these books in high school. And I had a, I had a horrible high school. It's a big public high school in one of the suburbs, Oldham Park, mm-hmm. Kansas, it's outside of Kansas City, mm-hmm. and really hadn't read much of anything prior to going off to college. And so this was a two-year program for freshmen and sophomores. And we began the first semester in a, with the Greek an elective authors. program. It wasn't like it was uh, part of their normal general education. It was an elective program. I mean, was that something that well, drew you was, to Kansas it, in the it, first place, or you became aware of it once you had already uh, 
uh, apply? Well, it is interesting. When I got into the program, it satisfied all of your English requirements, your Western Civ, and your speech requirements. So it covered a lot of the required core courses. They eventually, because the program became so controversial, they stripped that away. But, uh, you know, that's one of the things that attracted students is, hey, I can knock out these uh, basic courses by taking this integrated program, which included history, English, speech, Western Civ, all these things. Um, and like I said, it, it was four semesters. Uh, we read the Greek authors, first semester, like the Iliad and the Odyssey and uh, Aesop's Fables and uh, various other uh, Greek works, classics. And then the second semester, we read Romans, read the Aeneid and Caesar's Gallic Wars, Ovid. And then the third semester, we read Christian authors as literature, not as, mm -hmm. you know, religion, because you couldn't teach religion at a state university. So we read parts, portions of the Bible, and we read uh, the Confessions of St. Augustine and the life of Charlemagne. And we ended that semester with the uh, Little Flowers of St. Francis of Assisi, which is considered a classic. Um, and then the last semester, we read the Moderns. We began with... Uh, uh, Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, and we read uh, uh, Don Quixote, we read a few Shakespeare plays and a few Dickens novels. We read John Henry Newman, um, which I had never read before, which had a huge influence on my life. And then we ended up with the great American classic, The Oregon Trail. Um, so it was a wide sweep of Western literature um, and books that as they said, you all should have read these in high school. So we're just giving you a chance to read these books that every, you know, 75 years ago, every student uh, was familiar with these texts. They were part of the core of education. So were you um, kind of lapping it up? Were you, were, you were kind of taken with these, or were there some that were harder to, to uh, make, you know, make sense of? Or, I mean, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was, you know, like, like I said, we were ordinary students. We were an honor student and everything. And the, and the professors helped us to understand the books because they're not easy to read. But they are written really for every, you know, for every man so uh, and every woman. It, it's, you know, these books um, are, are pretty much um, basic standard text. So um, they weren't that complicated. Um, but the program, that you, the, the unique thing about this program was it's not just a um, – you know, an intellectual program. The uh, the motto of the program was let them be born in wonder. And the idea was to let to get the students just to look up and to ask these questions, to look up at the stars, because we had a stargazing session. We'd learn the constellation of the constellation of the stars because they worked into the literature we're reading, especially the Greek Pagan literature. You didn't have an app at that but, point that would tell you what the constellations No, is. we didn't have an app to find out where these <laughs> constellations were. We had to pick them out ourselves. Um, I actually took astronomy my did. last semester at Iowa State just for the fun of it. I had credits to burn, so I, a man after my own yeah. year. So. Yeah, it's, it's, it's fascinating. It's, it's fascinating. But um, so that, you know, we had uh, anything that would – kind of lift our hearts and our minds to ask questions like what is truth what is goodness what is beauty and all the literature and 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 the other things that we did like for instance we learned how to write uh in script you know with these osmoroid pens so we could you know kind of write this beautiful script and then we also had at the end of the year which was the big social event in fact my mom and dad went to that one day one year mm -hmm. uh that it was a, it was a it was a formal waltz where the students had to learn how to to waltz and you get this dance card and you had like six different for the for the gentleman you had six different women on the card and you'd have to go out and escort her out onto the dance floor. I, mean, I hired the university orchestra, university ballroom, and you had to dance one of these Straussian waltzes. Uh, without making a klutz of yourself, and but those are pretty uh, good the idea there. Pretty good odds for the guys, though. Yeah. I mean, six months. <laughs> yeah, it was great, great deal. Oh, um, but you know, you, it was a, it was to teach the men to be gentlemen and the women to be ladies. And again, beauty, mm -hmm. uh, introducing introducing something that's very beautiful, the music, the dancing, 
And then we also had to memorize poetry. Um, that was that was one hour a week. We had to memorize just reams and reams of poetry because the professors realized we had no no imagine no uh, poetic imagination. We hadn't learned any of the great poems, or if we did, they were just little snippets uh, of of things that were pretty superficial. So they wanted to build up kind of a repertoire of poetry in our imagination, so that we'd have these great verses that you know for centuries had been part of you know the educational core uh, so, of, so really of forming your culture. souls forming your souls giving the intellectual habitus that would uh, you know be able then to like you say to wonder to imagine and to see things uh, in some larger scale of being and hopefully maybe inspire to wisdom in this way now dr john senior became a pivotal person in your life could you elaborate a little bit there yeah, he was one of the three. There were three professors, and they all kind of team taught this course. And uh, John Sr. ended up being my godfather when I converted. Because he was godfather for a lot of the students. But uh, he uh, was, of the three, he was kind of the mystic. Uh, Frank Nellick was a former World War II Navy pilot. So he was sort of the rough and gruff character. Everybody was afraid of... Uh, Frank Nellick. Every faculty always... needs a curmudgeon. Every faculty needs a curmudgeon. <laughs> that's right. That's right. He'd wear he'd wear these aviator glasses, you know, and he kind of you'd never really know what he was thinking. And then Dennis Quinn, who was the director of the program, he kind of kept things on track because between Senior and Nellick, they'd go off on these tangents, and he'd bring them all back. But all three would sit up there and teach at the same time. Hmm. And um, interesting thing was that we. We didn't. We weren't allowed to take notes. We just we were just supposed to listen. So it kind of taught us how to just be quiet and listen, not to write frantically, as 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 they're teaching. Um, and the tests were. I think you'd were have all to strap my oral. hand down. I think you'd have to strap my hand down and just instinctively pick it. Yeah. Pen, oh so. yeah. Everybody was so used to just yeah. feverishly taking notes. Yeah. But John Senior was the one who had probably the biggest influence on me, and then when I. After I finished the program my junior year, I started to ask myself, you know, what what I believe in. You know, do I believe in God? I never was an atheist, but I probably was an agnostic. Like, you know, who's to say? Mm-hmm. And so I started church hopping, and then um, realized I was kind of naive, but realized that a lot of my classmates were Catholic or had converted to the Catholic faith. And so I said, oh, I better check out this Catholic church. And I started looking into the Catholic Church, and in the Catholic Church, as I was studying it, I realized that the fullness of truth and goodness and beauty, whether it be history, art, architecture, literature, poetry, um, philosophy, theology, you know, the Catholic Church had a huge influence. And so the history of the Catholic Church, and then the claim that the Catholic Church uh, can trace itself back to the apostles, um, kind of in an unbroken apostolic succession. You know, those were the things intellectually that convinced me uh, of the truth of the Catholic faith, um, and and the beauty uh, drew me to it. Mm-hmm. Um, but then again, it was you know nobody converts merely by their intellect. There was the heart, too. And it was the friendships that I made with, uh, and who I still, in fact, uh, for my mother's funeral, which was just uh, last Tuesday, a week, uh, it'll be a week tomorrow, a lot of my classmates who are fellow converts, married, uh, kids all grown up, grandkids now, um, they came to the funeral. Wow. And um, it was just beautiful to see these friendships that uh, are now over 45 years old. Wow. And um, so, you know, we, we, we traveled this journey together, uh, which changed our lives, um, upset the university, <laughs> mm-hmm. because there were some of the students whose parents got, got uh, upset, but my parents ended up converting. And so I ended up, we found out that they weren't baptized. So about six years after I was ordained a priest, I, I ended up baptizing and confirming and giving First Holy Communion to my mom and dad. What a grace. What a grace. Which was 
What a grace. What a yeah. gift. And so, obviously, you weren't proselytizing your parents, you know, coming home and kind of ruining family dinners. No. By, you know, <laughs> and the catechism says this, you know. But, uh, but uh, right. no, well, I was, you know, and... I was sick of, yeah, I was kind of sick in my, like most converts, I was pretty obnoxious, you know, <laughs> sticking, sticking my foot in my mouth a lot. But uh, there's a funny story that uh, when I came home, I made the mistake, I don't recommend this, but I made this mistake of, uh, going ahead and becoming Catholic before I told my parents. Mm. And so I came home uh, halfway through, well, it was my, my, after my first semester, my junior year, and I told my parents. My mom was happy. She was glad. She was just glad that I got my hair cut. You know, this was back in the 70s. Mm. And I was kind of cleaning up, you know, cleaning up my act a bit. And uh, my father said, I knew it. I knew it. I saw this coming. He says, now the Catholic Church is going to make all your decisions for you. You've given up your freedom to think, son. Mm -hmm. Catholic Church, the Pope's going to make all your decisions for you. <laughs> so, um, so and then we got in an argument about it. I said, no, that's not true. And then fast forward about, um, it would be about 15, 16 years later, my parents are coming into the church, and I couldn't resist it. My dad's standing at the baptismal font. And I said, now, Dad, if I do this, you know that the Catholic Church is going to now make all your decisions for you, and the Pope's going to make <laughs> oh, all your decisions. Oh, snarky. And, you. <laughs> and he, <laughs> I couldn't resist it. Yeah. And he said, no, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> so, wow. That's beautiful. And he became, you know, he was he was very, he was he died, like, like Missing died in 2006, but he was a very devout Catholic uh, his whole life. Wow, tremendous. So, I mean, you know, spend the time of his conversion. I can tell we could easily spend an hour together, but uh, we're going to have to take a little pause here as uh, we go. But I hope you'll stay with us, Bishop Connolly, and uh, a few uh, additional thoughts from you. Some questions I'll pose to you, but thank you for sharing so far. We're going to take a thank quick you. break. You're listening to Making It Personal with Bishop Johnson on Iowa Catholic Radio and the Spirit Catholic Radio Network. Is it time for a new roof? Then it could be time for you to get to know Bell Construction. Bell Construction is a roofing company entering its 30th year of business. They specialize in residential re-roofs, like commercial jobs, and have the experience to meet all of your roofing needs with personal service. With Bell Construction, the owner will come to your home or place of business in person to inspect and ensure the quality of work that you deserve. They pride themselves in working with you on a personal basis and making sure you are satisfied. Bell Construction, 515-963-4494. What is the best gift ever? Giving a Catholic education is at the top of my list. Your contribution to CTO helps families send their children to our Catholic schools who otherwise could not afford it. In giving to CTO, you receive the best tax credits ever. Pledge or donate online at ctoiowa.org. The bottom line, it's for the kids and their future. Welcome back to Making It Personal with Bishop Johnson. We are still here with Bishop James Conley of the Diocese of Lincoln. All right. And in the new year here, as we uh, commemorate and kind of wind down the Christmas season, the Feast of the Baptism of the Lord coming up this Sunday as we broadcast. I have a quote for you from the, the late Francis Cardinal George, I think someone we all respect. Uh, and then maybe just a, a question that follows up with that. So Cardinal George said, all baptized Christians, of course, have the office of witness. They can speak authentically from their personal experience of grace about who Christ is for them. The important difference of the apostolic office is that the successors of the apostles must speak about who Christ is for everyone. So the, just uh, asking you to reflect, as you're in your role as Bishop of Lincoln, how your whole perspective on the humanities and liberal arts, which you've been sharing with us, does that inform your oversight of Catholic education and faith formation for people of all ages in your diocese? Uh, yes, it does. And uh, Cardinal George, of course, is a font of wisdom. He's a great hero of mine, and I've always uh, admired him. Um, as do many, many people. Um, but I think that uh, in my own experience, and people in Lincoln know this, uh, my own experience of uh, the reading the great books and uh, liberal education um, has influenced my thinking about Catholic education. And we are blessed to have very good schools in the diocese. But I believe that uh, we've all been influenced by sort of, I call it this industrial model of education, which really is geared to prepare students, young people for careers and how to uh, 
uh, get a good job or how to get to the best universities to get a good job, and those kinds of things. Which in and of themselves is not a bad thing. We all need to work. We all need to get good jobs. I'm not against that. But what's been sacrificed, it seems, is this um, formation of the whole person, body, soul, mind, spirit, um, where they are uh, immersed in you know, the best that's been said and written throughout the history of the world and um, forming their imaginations to uh, really kind of cultivate and engender a love of learning so that they, students, will want to continue to pursue the truth, goodness, and beauty uh, in, throughout their whole lives. They want to continue to read. You know, oftentimes students, you know, when they graduate or they finish a class, they'll get rid of their books, sell their books, because they're really of no use to them. But uh, and get ten cents on the dollar that, for those. Yeah, <laughs> books. Yeah, what are, exactly. books. What are those? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's really you don't get much at all. But I mean, now books are disappearing. I mean, it's uh, it, you know, it's all becoming digital. Um, but I think that. Uh, and there is a resurgence in, um, I hate to use the word classical education because that kind of intimidates people. Um, I like to think of it as liberal arts. Uh, there seems to be a resurgence of the liberal arts, certainly among the homeschooling communities uh, throughout the country, but also in schools that are cropping up here and there. I'm on the board of the Institute for Catholic Liberal Education. And there's all kinds of uh, schools that are cropping up, whether it be charter schools or private schools or even Catholic schools in, in dioceses. Um, We're certainly seeing that in the Des Moines diocese. diocese as well. Yes, you know, the Have you seen that in Des Moines? Yeah, Des Moines, the St. Thomas uh, Academy and other movements there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's the Diocese of Marquette, all of their schools. Now, they only have nine diocesan schools, but they've all gone to a, uh, a liberal arts curriculum. Mm -hmm. And I think... The, the importance there is that it forms the whole person and it, it, it engenders a joy and a love of learning that kind of the standard um, model that we've been using for the past 25 or 50 years doesn't. It makes learning kind of a drudgery. Indeed. It takes sort of the fun Indeed. out of learning. Well, Bishop Connolly, we've reached the end of our time here, and uh, obviously this conversation will go on again, so we're going to have to have you on again, but thank you for making time. Absolutely. Grace, I'd love to be on Grace, again. see you and your sister as you go through your mother's effects. May that be a labor of love as you finally remember her. This has been another edition of thank Making you, it Personal with Bishop Appreciate Johnson. Thank you to our guests and all of our listeners in Iowa, Nebraska, and Wisconsin, and Iowa Catholic Radio and Spirit Catholic Radio Network. You can hear Making It Personal with Bishop William Johnson every week on Iowa Catholic Radio and iowacatholicradio.com.